Still hadn't heard it. Oh, I heard it. Oh, did somebody say Newburn? You did. I thought I heard it. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. See, I'm having trouble with my hearing too. I can't read and I can't see. Phil, I know they're ready to get you up here. Thank you. All right. Well, please join me in saying our defining statement. Kiwanis is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to improving the world one child and one community at a time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Brody will share our invocation. Let us pray. Oh God, you give us the food necessary to sustain our lives. We thank you for food and we thank you for the great resources of this nation. Thank you for the children of this world who are entrusted to our care. Look for with compassion on the whole human family who are all made in your image. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts, break down the walls that separate us, unite us in the bonds of love. Work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brody. Now, I think Clay will lead us in song. Don't sit down. Stand up. Well, I have been trying to teach you all various songs. Today, the speaker has picked a song I think is not a challenge. If it is a challenge, sorry, God help you. It is America, and it starts at my country, and we will do a pitch, right? My, my country, tis a Thank you. It's good to hear that. <clears throat> so we have lots of new guests today. So if you have a guest, if you'll stand up and we'll get you a microphone. Francis is going to help us. Yes, I have uh, Rick White here today. Rick, stand up a minute. Rick is, uh, is retired after four decades in the public relations world. He uh, culminating in being the chief communications uh, person for two Fortune 500 companies. His last job before real retirement was as Associate Vice Chancellor at UNC Chapel Hill for Communications. He is the proud father of three. I think he's got five grandkids. And he is a former member of this club back when it met at Valentine's. So, yeah, okay. So welcome, Rick. Yeah, <clears throat> My name's Brody, and I wanted to reintroduce Joanne Harville, who's with our firm. Joanne and her husband have a 19-year-old daughter who's at Wake Tech, and uh, she has the distinction of not only having to had to suffer through the North Carolina bar, but to be licensed in Michigan and in Tennessee. What an accomplishment. Joanne, Joelle. <clears throat> I have a guest, uh, I'm from Rowan County, as y'all may know, and our guest is from Rowan County, but she came to, uh, to Raleigh to marry Jim Turner, who some of y'all may know. Uh, Susan Shin Turner uh, is my guest. She's from China Grove, 
and I'm from Granite Quarry, but y'all been to both those places, I'm sure. Uh, she's been an English teacher. Uh, she's a, a freelance writer. Uh, she does a lot of different things, but we're glad to have her here as our guest today. All right, good afternoon, fellow Kiwanians. Uh, I'm Wayne Goodwin, and I'm pleased to have with me as my guest uh, someone I've known all his life, my son Jackson. If you'll stand up, Jackson. Stand up, Jackson. Jackson. Mm -hmm. Jackson begins 10th grade at Enloe High School this coming Monday, and uh, he drove me here because he has his learner's permit, and I'm watching him like a hawk. <laughs> so thank you, Jackson, for joining me today. We have another guest over here. Fellow Kiwanians, I'm, I'm very pleased today to have my Indian brother, Krupa Ralk and Charla. Some of you old timers might remember a program I did about 12, 15 years ago about my trip to India. And Krupa Rao is the reason I went to India. He currently lives and has been for a while in Astoria, Oregon, where he has a very successful business, but does spend a lot of time in India, mostly in the Mupala area, which is a small village sort of in southeastern India. But Krupa and I hadn't seen each other in a long time. It's great to have him in Raleigh for a couple of days. And He's trying to talk me into one more trip to India, so stay tuned about one more program. Krupa Rao Kancharla. Fantastic. Thank you. And Frances is going to share our membership welfare. Before she does, I definitely want to say a big round of thanks to Sandra for filling in for me last week. And I also want to say Helen Ballantyne, a former member, um, I was able to have lunch with her last week, and she sends a hello to everyone. So she misses you all. Okay, Francis. Um, so I have membership welfare. I'm trying to be buck today. Um, Courtney is going to begin her treatment, so we're keeping her in our thoughts and prayers. Tarver is recovering. Randy Hartley is here. Yay, Randy. Um, John House's wife, Emma, broke her hip and was just released from the hospital. And um, Bob Brooks is in hospice, so I know we all have been thinking of him. Um, Frank Jolly, who is a former member of our club, passed on Wednesday. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. So take a look around the room. We see who we're with. If we're not here, let's give them a call and check on them and certainly keep those families in our thoughts and prayers who are experiencing loss now. Now we'll move into a few announcements. So today, where is Meredith? Oh, sorry. So today we're doing our 50-50 raffle. And if you want to participate, I think you, I think we've closed it. Um, are we going to, we're going to allow people to continue buying today. And we'll do the drawing since we're not meeting next Friday for the holiday the following Friday. So Meredith has the red box. And is there anything you want to say and add to that, Meredith? 50% of the pot can go in your hands. Right now we have $150 total. So if you add to it, just think about what you could take home. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Salvation Army is tonight. Robbie, thank you. And Robert. Cooper, thank you guys for volunteering tonight um, from 4 to 6.30, serving those at the Salvation Army. So thank you. And the pancake breakfast. You want me to announce? Oh, go ahead. So the pancake breakfast, I just want to make sure everybody sees. This is one of the deliverables. If you're a sponsor of the pancake breakfast, the placemats, mention your name prominently if you put up more money than others. Um, this is the one from 2019. T-shirts. Um, everybody is familiar with the Pancake Breakfast T-shirts. And then this is the ad that ran in the North State Journal last year um, showing who sponsored our Pancake Breakfast. So you have an opportunity to participate in all that for 2023. And I've put sponsorship forms on each table. And there are a few extras over here. Thank you, Francis. And I see other chairs of other parts committees on the pancake breakfast. Does anybody have anything they want to say today? Yes. Uh, there are also forms of support for the volunteers. We've got a good group, but we're always in the so we haven't got up yet. 
Thank you. And for those online, if you are willing to sign up for the pancake breakfast, just email and or we can get your name on the list. Robert, do you want to share a bit about the membership drive? Okay, Phil's giving me the evil eye, so we got to speed it up. What am I going to say? <laughs> oh, my goodness. If every, if every member brought in one new member, we would double our club. So. Anyway, uh, as of September 1 through the end of the year, uh, Stacy and I are giving a $250 gift certificate to the Angus Park for the member that brings in the most members. So get to work. That's right. Not applicants, but the most members. So please do that. Ask your friends. See who you want to be with. Thank you, Robert. Remember, no meeting next Friday. It's a holiday. We will not be meeting, but we will uh, come back after that. And now, Francis will introduce our speaker. <laughs> so before I introduce our speaker, I just want to mention that Phil Kirk was president of our club during the difficult year of COVID, um, the first year of the 2020 year. Um, okay, now I'm going to read you what Phil wrote for his introduction. <laughs> this, is, this is a man who deserves no introduction. <laughs> he needs no introduction and he's not going to get an introduction. <laughs> I was surprised she read it just like I wrote it. <laughs> Today I'm um, going to share some humorous stories from the 750 schools and thousands of classrooms that I uh, attended when I was the chairman of the State Board of Education, along with some humor from the General Assembly, yes there is some, and the, and the governor's office. And I'll, at the top of the, this I want to say that all the stories are true. Even though I worked at the newspaper during my four years at Catawba College and then I taught journalism uh, in the public schools, uh, I didn't have to bring up fake news because all these stories are better than anything that I could make up. First, I want to say one thing serious so, so that you'll pay attention. There is value in having a sense of humor. A study by Vanderbilt University said that if one laughs 10 to 15 minutes a day, she or he will lose 50 calories. So you've got an opportunity today to lose some calories, but also I'd appreciate it if you, if you laugh at anything, you don't laugh too long because that'll cut into the story, time that I have for the stories to tell. Also, I read a University of Maryland study said that a sense of humor helps to protect you from uh, heart disease and it helps to relieve stress. So let's get started. I visited a school in Western North Carolina one time and a young student asked me what my name was. And I said, Mr. Kirk, it rhymes with jerk. And so when I left about 10 minutes later, he said, goodbye, Mr. Jerk. So <laughs> don't watch what you say to particularly to children because it may be repeated back to you. At another school, a little boy came running out and he said, are you one of the dudes? I said, what do you mean one of the dudes? He said, my teacher said some dude from Raleigh was coming down today and you look like one. <clears throat> Once I entered a kindergarten room as the children were getting ready to take a nap on their mats. And I'd left home early that morning. So I told him, I said, I wish I could take a nap with you, but I have to get on to the next school. Um, and the little boy said, teacher, we don't have a mat big enough for him. <laughs> the teacher replied, well, we could put several together. So that you learn from that, we have a lot of creative teachers in, in North Carolina. I visited a low performing school in Charlotte. Uh, yes, Charlotte has a lot of low performing schools, as does Raleigh, but we're, they're doing better. But uh, I was walking down the hall with the uh, superintendent who was very tall and a little boy came up to him and said, are you Abraham Lincoln? And then he came up to me and looked at my white hair and said, I bet you're George Washington. <laughs> Now, I was particularly proud because that was the low performing school. And for those students to know two presidents, uh, I thought that was a pretty good, 
pretty good thing. See, uh, Bertie County, some of you are from that part of the state. Uh, Bertie County is a relatively poor county uh, with very little industry or business. The superintendent and the principal and I were walking down the hall of a school. We were in our, you know, we were three white males with a dark suit like our um, friend here from the funeral home has on. Uh, and he, this little boy comes running out and he said, y'all from the funeral home, aren't you? <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris White, did he come in? He's usually late, but, uh, oh, he's online. Okay, well, I particularly wanted to, to, to uh, uh, for him to hear this one. Again, it's true. I went to Fayetteville one time and speak to uh, K through eight school and uh, I went up on stage and I was a little bit nervous and, and uh, nobody else was, but I saw this girl on stage she had on a Carolina shirt. And I said, uh, a Tar Heel shirt. And I said, oh, you couldn't find anything to wear today, could you? Well, that, that didn't go over, but she, so I'm, I'm a slow learner. And I said, oh, you must have dressed in the dark this morning. Again, she didn't say anything. So, and then I looked down at the program and I saw where she was gonna introduce me. <laughs> but she got up and read the introduction, but I'm a slow learner, some of you know, so I, I tried, said I'd try one more time. So I said, if, if Meredith uh, has, it behaves real well the, between now and Christmas, Santa Claus uh, may bring her a gift. He may bring her an NC State Wolfpack shirt. She stood up in front of 800 students and said, my standards are much higher than that. <laughs> we also um, had something called the ABCs of education and we presented awards and uh, I had, had a speech that, that I used a soft drink and I read out all the ingredients in the soft drink and I said, those are the ingredients that would make for, for a good school. And if you take out any of those ingredients, you know, it might not be so good. And so at every school, I would ask the students if they knew what the ingredients in the soft drink were. And I'd given it many times and nobody ever said anything. So imagine when I got to the third school that morning, the, a little girl stood up and named every ingredient and I was taken aback. And finally a school board member who was traveling with us to six schools that day, he had called ahead to the, get the principal to get a, a smart student who could memorize quickly. And so that's, but I, I got him back. We got to the next school and it rained a little bit. So I told all the students to sit on the, sit down on the, on the wet grass. And I said, oh, y'all got wet. When you get home, please tell them, and I named the school board member, please tell us that so-and-so school board member asked us to sit down on the grass. So I, I got back, back at him. Another time when I told that story, I said, uh, uh, talking about soft drinks, I said, if, um, if, if something happens that, uh, that you don't remember all, all this, this stuff, and uh, you, you are told uh, you, uh, some ingredients taken out, you might not like the soft drink, so you might drink iced tea, or you might drink uh, water, or you might drink something else. This little boy stood up, or beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm skipping some, because I know. I didn't think you were coming today. I was relieved when you weren't here to introduce me. One thing I used to have a good time doing, I'd, a lot of the uh, kindergartners would have on their name tag. They didn't realize what it was, I don't guess, but I'd, I'd call them by name and then look at me, how'd you find out my name? But they didn't realize it. I tied more shoes uh, of kindergartners and first and second graders than I thought I ever would. I also learned not to ask people how old they thought I was. Now keep in mind, this was 30 years ago. And there, at that time they were saying 81, 82, and now it would be close to accurate. But uh, also on, uh, on a slightly serious note, I think reading is the most important subject in our schools. If you don't know how to read by the end of third grade, uh, you're, you're destined to fail. There's some exceptions like Gary, you probably didn't know how to read by third grade, <laughs> but, uh, and, but you have generally succeeded. Um, but anyway, so we celebrated Dr. Seuss's birthday, for example, we'd go in and read to the children and went in and a, a teacher said, do you want to sit on the rocking chair or do you want to sit on the floor? And I was afraid I couldn't get up if I got on the floor. So I said, I'll sit in the rocking chair. 
And just as I sat down, uh, this little boy yelled, he's going to break it. He's going to break it. <laughs> now, this story is hard to believe, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's honestly true. I was in Alexander County one day, and the, the superintendent couldn't decide which school to take me to. So he took me to all 12 in the county. So I made 12 speeches, uh, brief speeches in one day and got to the 12th school. And the principal got up and said to the students that they re would read uh, 10,000 books, he'd kiss a pig. Well, the, uh, pr that was the superintendent. The principal said 15,000 uh, and he would kiss a pig. Well, I thought, you know, they're probably not gonna read 25,000, but I said, if y'all read 25,000, I'll come up to Alexander County and kiss the pig. Well, in the middle, about the middle of May, I get a letter. Well, we did it. Are you coming? <laughs> so the first thing I did was call Jim Graham, the agriculture commissioner, who was a member of this club, as many of you remember. And I said, Mr. Commissioner, how do you kiss a pig? He said, very carefully. <laughs> so I get there and I look, and the principal says, you want to meet the farmer who owns the pig? By the way, I've been told to quit telling this story, and that's why I keep telling it. But um, I, he said, do you want to meet the farmer who, who brought the pig? And I said, well, I've driven four hours. I'll do anything that's legal that you want me to do. So I go up to him and he says, are you going to French kiss my pig? <laughs> <laughs> well, I kissed the pig and uh, the principal had the nerve to say the students on the other side of the gym didn't see it. So could you do it a second time? So again, I'm a, I'm a slow learner. I get down to Carteret County about a year ago and same thing, they challenged me to kiss the pig and I ended up having to kiss the pig and I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> I've got that in my obituary, by the way, so I uh, don't have to do it anymore. Uh, I spoke to some students in an alternative high school and I'll read you, the, they're real short, so I'll read you ver word for word what they said. Dear Mr. Kirk, I wanna thank you for coming and spending some time. I believe what you said is mostly true. Education is the key to a successful life. I also want to thank you for getting us out of class. <laughs> Dear Mr. Kirk, I'm really glad you came. After all, it got us out of class and your speech was real informative and very good not to have been planned. <laughs> I'm sure everyone here feels the same way I do. If they don't like getting out of class, there's nothing wrong with them, but thank you. For, there is something wrong with them, but thank you for coming. Dear Mr. Kirk, what you said was quite helpful. I may have helped you figure out how to fix your email. Make sure that you turn off your pop-up blocker on your web browser. Next time, try not to ramble on so much. I kind of lost my attention <laughs> toward the end. Overall, thank you and I enjoyed having you come. And then one last one. I really appreciate your getting us out of class. <laughs> I was really surprised at how knowledgeable you were and how well you answered our questions. Thank you. And then the, my final one up from the school group was the most, uh, and I've started to tell this every year on Veterans Day when we meet, but we've always had a, a good program and I didn't want to, to, uh, to interrupt, which some of you need to learn that. Um, not looking at anybody in particular. <laughs> one of the most best things I think the legislature's ever done uh, was they passed a resolution saying that the State Board of Education could grant honorary diplomas to uh, men, at that time it was all men, who had gone into World War II and who were lucky to, enough to come home and who had not finished high school, that we could have a ceremony and give out diplomas uh, to them. So we had a ceremony and had people in their 80s and 90s and 70s, and, and I never will forget what three of them said to me. Um, as I handed him his diploma, he said, I'm not going to shake your hand. I didn't know what he was going to do. He put his arms around me and hugged me and then went down into the audience and hugged every member of the state board. Then another one said, and keep in mind their ages, another one said, I got to hurry home and update my resume. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one I'll never forget. <clears throat> he held up his diploma toward heaven and he said, look, mama, I finally got it and everybody in the room just cried. And that had a lot of meaningful things happen, but that was certainly one of them. <clears throat> now we'll move on to the legislature. Um, Senator Marshall Roush, who by the way, has just turned 100. Um, there are three senators that 
Well, two senators that I served with, uh, three out of 50 are still living. And Senator Roush is one of them. He just turned 100 in Gastonia. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, Eddie Knox, the former mayor of Charlotte and a former Democratic candidate for governor, uh, in the primary at least, um, and I'm the third one. So my goal is to be the last one uh, standing. <clears throat> Don't need any comments on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was youngest. I've got a joke about that too. But uh, a lot of people thought I was a joke. But you know, uh, Senator Marshall Roush again told me about the very first speech he made on the floor of the Senate as a new senator, and he knew he was going to be on television because he was speaking on a controversial subject. Sure enough, he got up and TV lights came on, and he was right to a key point in his sentence. And Senator Herman Moore, who sat behind him, and he held up this piece of paper and said, your zipper's open. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> and he, he, immediately, he immediately sat down. And then the, the next one is a, a personal story. Um, believe it or not, it was a little bit more partisan 50 years ago than it is now uh, in a different way. It was partisan because the Democrats in the majority, and by the way, the Republicans would have done the same thing, so this is not a partisan comment. The Democrats wouldn't allow Republicans to introduce any bills that they wanted passed. So you had to get a Democrat to sponsor the bill, and then you could co-sponsor. So I knew I wouldn't be able to get reelected. I already decided I wanted to run for reelection, and I knew I wouldn't be able to get reelected on my uh, record. So I thought, well, I'll run on having perfect attendance. So uh, somehow my wife had gotten pregnant during the campaign, and she she went um, she went back to Salisbury to to have the baby. And I, of course, was in Raleigh. I do want to tell you that I was able to get there when the baby was born. But then I hurried back to Raleigh, and Pat Taylor was the lieutenant governor, and he made some mention on the floor of the Senate about the baby being born. And Senator Ruffin Bailey, who some of you may remember from here in Wake County, he stood up and he said, "I make." A motion that we pass the hat around and collect money from the senators so he will bring up and buy a democratic party handbook so that he can bring his party up in the right party unlike the party that he was from and i said well i thought fast for some reason i got up and i said well senator bailey that's nice of you you can take up uh, uh, money if you want to and you can waste it like you do the taxpayers money <laughs> by the way you could get by with that today i, I mean I, I was teasing uh sort of but, uh, and so uh, a little bit later, Senator Giles Coggins also from, uh, from here, he came up to me, just said it to me. He said, why didn't you tell, oh no, I left out a line, I'm sorry. Uh, by the way, when I fell and hurt, hurt my head and I bled around the brain and I was told I'd forget things. So now every time I forget something, I can, I can blame it on my uh, brain bleed. <laughs> But what I said was, I, you'll waste the money uh, and it won't do any good because I knew my, wife, my daughter was born a Republican because she was born with her eyes open. Well, <laughs> Senator Giles Coggins, another good Democrat, that's not an oxymoron, by the way. Uh, Giles Coggins came up to me and he said, uh, why didn't you tell the whole story? You could tell she was born a Republican because she was born with her mouth open. <laughs> I'm sorry to say we don't joke that much like we used to, but uh, I had an embarrassing, uh, talking about being young, I had an embarrassing campaign experience one time. I was campaigning and I handed this guy a card and with my picture on and platform and all, and he said, uh, why in the hell would I vote for a young squirt like you? I didn't know what, I was speechless, believe it or not. And I started just to walk away. Well, I, I decided to answer him and I don't remember what I said, but he said, I was going to vote for you anyway. I just wanted to see what you'd say. So I, I was glad that ended be better than I thought it would. Uh, Representative Bill Culpepper's father served several sessions in the House, and Representative Culpepper, the one that we knew, um, asked his father why he didn't ever say anything on the floor or why he didn't make any speeches. And his father said it's uh, better to remain seated and be thought a fool than to rise and remove all doubt. And uh, they don't remember that one anymore either. Uh, Senator Lamar Gudger uh, was explaining a series of bills having to do with ABC alcoholic beverage control laws. And when he was, he was interrupted by Senator Arthur Williamson from uh, Columbus County. Uh, and Williamson said, I believe the Senator's speaking on the wrong bill. And he was. 
Senator I.C. Crawford was another unusual <laughs> senator from, from Buncombe County. And after there was a lengthy debate on no-fault automobile insurance, uh, Senator Crawford told the Senate, I know less than I did before the debate. Uh, I know less than, than I did before, before the debate started. So now quickly moving to a few uh, stories from the governor's office. Both Governor Holsauser and Governor Martin both like to play golf, but they treated me differently. Uh, Governor Martin said I couldn't go play golf with him because when he was out of the office, I was needed even more in the office. Governor Holsauser had a different approach. Uh, he wasn't a very good golfer. He was left-handed for one thing. I'm not saying left-handers aren't any good, but uh, he was a left-handed golfer, and I was the only one he knew that he could beat. And because he played with Highway Patrol uh, security and SBI security, and I was the fourth, and so uh, uh, we had had a good time. I never did uh, uh, never did win, but a few of you are old enough to remember a columnist for the NNO named Jack Aulis. Uh, he wrote the humorous columns, and so anytime he didn't have anything to write about, he'd come to the governor's office to try to see if we had any stories. And he asked uh, the governor's Highway Patrol driver. He said. Uh, something about me and uh, Senate, uh, Sergeant Team uh, said, I'd rather stand on my head and gargle peanut butter than have Phil Kirk as my golf partner. <laughs> <laughs> when I worked for Senator uh, Broyhill in Washington, he was on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And the first several weeks I was there, either on a Monday or a Friday, he would say, I'm going out on an environmental mission. And I thought, well, that's nice you working on Monday or Friday and going out to study the environment. It took me about a month to find out that meant he was going to play golf. <laughs> we had a number of people who wrote to the governor on a regular basis. And there wasn't email way back then. And one of my jobs was to go through the mail part of it and decide what to show the governor and what not to. And by the way, governors can, can't even see 5% uh, of the uh, communications that come into their office. And that's a really hard thing to do is to decide which 5%. Uh, sometimes you can summarize them, but uh, uh, one woman in one of her letters on page six with the question, well, I'll shut up, aren't you glad? And I really wanted to draft the response back, but I, I didn't. The governor also hears from a lot of prisoners because he has some authority about, or used to, about uh, reducing sentences. One came about uh, the Christmas. Dear Santa, I called the governor Santa, would you please send me a small time cut? Say 10 years. I have 30 years and I don't think I can make all of it. I've been good except for three infractions. Another, a woman wrote of her uh, concern with the crime rate. She owned a home at the beach and there'd been a lot of break-ins. She said, Governor, I have personally been broken in through three times. Then one thing in the legislature that's very controversial is any time they try to raise their own salaries. So as a result, uh, the legislative salaries have been around $14,000 ever since I was in the legislature and hadn't been raised in 30, 40 years. And so I found a couple quotes uh, about that. Pat Taylor again was presiding and Eddie Knox uh, was talking about how bad the salaries were. And Pat Taylor interrupted him and said, uh, did the amount of pay that you were getting, did that affect your decision to run for the legislature? And he said, no, but it's affecting my decision to leave the legislature. An another person was ranting and raving about the, the uh, salaries being not, not raised them. And the presiding officer at that time said, all I can say is if, if uh, legislators had to, had to live, it was about Caesar's wife being above reproach and said if Caesar's wife had, had tried to live on our salary, she wouldn't have been above reproach very long. <laughs> on another uh, <clears throat> serious one, it starts out serious, but 1974, uh, a number of people were dying from taking the flu shot. And so there was a lot of concern about taking the flu shot. And I was secretary of DHHS then, and at staff meeting one week, uh, uh, some smart aleck on my staff said, suggested that I have a press conference and take the flu shot to make to show that it wasn't anything uh, dangerous about it. So I said, okay, what was I going to do? Say no, and one of them leak it to the N and O, and you know, said I refused to take it. So I knew I had to take it. 
So I wasn't real worried, but when I came into work that morning, I uh, called uh, my assistant in and I dictated my will to her uh, in, in, case, uh, in case something uh, happened. But I took the shot and uh, this was before cell phones. And I used to have the rule that I always called my wife to let her know that I'd gotten to wherever I was going out of town. And for some reason I forgot to call her. So the next morning when I called, she said, are you okay? And I said, what do you mean okay? She said, well, you always call and you didn't call after you got in the flu shot. Uh, President Ford happened to take the flu shot on the same day, uh, not in Raleigh, but uh, so our pictures got in a lot of papers together newspapers. Um, now if I could close with the, uh, almost close with the, and then I'll leave a few time for questions that don't have to be about what I've said. Um, and y'all's questions many times are not about anything that the speaker had to say. So I'm used to, we're used to that. I'm often asked what I'm most proud of uh, in the 50 years that I served. Um, first, no one person accomplishes anything whether it's government or business or politics, it's usually a team effort. So when I've mentioned these, I want to emphasize it's not that one person did it. You have to provide leadership for it. When I worked, when we, Governor Holshouser took office, we had a very small staff and none of us knew what we were doing. We were all young and we needed all the help we could get. And so people kept asking, well, do this, do that. And I thought to myself, we ought to start a page program. The legislature has a page program, and so that's what I copied, where you have a young person, usually in middle school or high school, serve as a page. So I started, or we started the governor's page program, and Governor Cooper was nice enough uh, a few weeks, a few months ago now, where he celebrated the 50th anniversary of the governor's page program and invited me to come over and speak at the, the mansion about it, which I thought was a nice bipartisan thing to do and over 35,000 young people have gone through the governor's page program. So I feel really good about that. It gives them a, a positive experience, mostly. <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember when we had no vending machines in the rest areas. At one point there were no vending machines in the rest areas. Well, again, in my D DHS, Department of Health and Human Services, we had blind services division. And the blind, blind people run the uh, snack bars in all the courthouses, or they used to. And so somebody had an idea that we ought to put uh, uh, vending machines in the rest areas and let the blind people have responsibility for them. They, they didn't have to be there in person. And we had a trouble getting it through the legislature. Now, I always thought that it was because the convenience stores were lobbied against it. But uh, David Diamond and others said, no, it was because that people would trash and litter the rest areas if they had vending machines in, in the area. But anyway, we finally got the vending machines uh, after a long battle. We finally got the vending machines in the, in the rest areas. And then because of my job at the state chamber, I had the opportunity to chair the two largest bond issues in state history. Uh, 1996, two and a half billion dollars for K-12 schools and roads. And then in the year 2000, uh, UNC system, community college, and UNC TV had the biggest bond issue uh, in, in history at that time. Oh, you see, Robert, you don't give Republicans much credit, but we. Uh, <laughs> Robert does say that that I'm his favorite Republican. He just doesn't have any others. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> then um, one time when I, I was unemployed many times in my career, and I've held many different jobs, and one time uh, one of my granddaughters asked me, uh, Grandpa, what do you do? Well, I didn't want to tell her I was unemployed. So I said, I'm a consultant. <laughs> she said, Grandpa, what's a consultant? I said, well, a consultant goes into a business or even a church or a school or wherever and studies everything that's going on and what they are doing and how they do it. And then I make suggestions for change. And my granddaughter said, Grandpa, at school we call those people pests. <laughs> <laughs> and then some of you have heard this before because I always end what I'm going to say with the letter I got from fifth graders. Dear Mr. Kirk, thank you for coming to tell us about it. 
We hope you'll come back. You told us more than enough. <laughs> so I'll be glad. To, I'll be glad to. Uh, I've got, by the way, I've started to say I, I have four hours of these stories, but I knew we needed to stop it. So I stopped a little bit early. Anybody have any comments or questions or? Yeah, the person who gets the microphone gets to ask the most important question. Well, I, I meant to thank you for that gracious introduction. <laughs> Anytime. It was exactly what I deserved. <laughs> well, so Phil, you're you are someone who um, has accomplished many things, but you're an expert on certain things, and we just really want to know exactly how do you kiss a pig? How do I what? How do you kiss a pig? <laughs> Get to pick what I'm an expert on. <laughs> uh, Oh, oh, I wear hearing aids, but I don't always hear very well. I, I kissed it near the mouth. And that's at the front of the pig, John, if you don't know. <laughs> Anybody else in here ever kissed a pig? See, I've done something unusual, yes. Do you think it's possible for a, a low or middle income person to get into politics and actually make a difference? Well, a few misguided people have asked me uh, why I didn't run for higher office. And I said, now I say I'm too old, but I've said uh, I couldn't afford it because when you run for public office, particularly if you run for governor, you have to campaign full time for two years. And I didn't have the financial resources to do that. Uh, and nobody would agree to put me on their payroll uh, to do nothing uh, while I run for governor. And it's very, it's virtually impossible for a poor or I wouldn't say middle income, but lower middle income person to run for a statewide office. Uh, it used to be you could run for school board, although I don't know why anybody would want to do that, <laughs> uh, or, or local office without spending much money, but that's no longer. Uh, true. So I'm not doing a very good job of answering, except it, it's very, it would be very difficult, um, to be honest. Now, you could also work in a, in a firm, a law firm or a big business, and if your boss was sympathetic, he or she could let you could, could run. Um, but when I was in the legislature, I had to resign from teaching school. Um, so I, I had to work at the newspaper and uh, work at a hamburger place and my legislative salary, and those three together allowed me to continue to eat at least. So it's fair, but I don't know the answer to it. I don't believe in public, I don't believe in taxpayer financing of campaigns, so I, I don't support that. I, I don't know that there is a solution except for people to help that person if they think they do a good job by giving political contributions. But it's hard, it's difficult. That's why the legislature, need, in my opinion, I can say that since I'm not there, Legislature needs to give you a constitutional amendment to vote on four-year terms for legislators so they don't have to spend all their time running for re-election. Uh, by the way, we had an amendment to allow that about 30 years ago, and it failed four to one in North Carolina. Now it probably only failed three to one, but um, it'd be very, it's, it's very difficult when you have to spend all your time raising money. It used to, I thought it was amusing, Jim Goodman at WRAL used to, used to, uh, criticize uh, all the big spending in the campaigns. Who do you think gets the most, <laughs> most money from TVs, TV uh, ads and consultants? Yes, Susan, so, is this on the record? Yes, it is, okay. it's on the record. So when you were visiting all the schools, was there a particular program or a particular school district that most impressed you or that has kind of stuck with you? Hmm, that's a hard one. The variety, the variety of programs, and again, my main issue was reading, and so seeing the different ways that reading could be taught. Also in Wake County, there are students, uh, I was impressed, or I guess is the right word, in Wake County, there are students who speak 104 different languages. In Wake County, there are students in our public schools who, who uh, speak at least 104 different languages. 
I used to tell people my students couldn't understand me in English. I didn't know how they'd do all that. So that's, that's a challenge. That's not a, but I think the, there are a lot of innovative programs that don't get any publicity. Now, if you attach some controversy to them, they will. But uh, uh, it impressed me about how hard teachers work. And, uh, and well, I could go on and on with that one, but uh, it, it's a challenging. When I taught school, the two biggest problems I had were students uh, chewing gum in, in class or throwing spitballs. <laughs> and now you can imagine what the serious problems are, Gary. Did you spank your children in class? Oh, that's one story I left out that I had. No, I didn't, I didn't spank my children, but I got spanked in the second grade. Uh, and guess what for? Talking too much. <laughs> and I told that story. I had it in my notes. I can't believe I didn't tell it. But I told that story, again, in Fayetteville. And as I was leaving, this teacher said, uh, come over here. Uh, this little boy wants to ask you something. And he said, you didn't learn much from that story, did you? <laughs> but the teacher could tell how my self-esteem had been lowered with that comment. And she said, you also need to know that he leaned over and said, you said some good things in your speech. So I, that made me feel a little better. Yes, sir, Robert. Um, do you see any uh, hope for the divisiveness in politics? I think we're out of time. <laughs> You know, I don't see any hope for it to change during our lifetime, excuse me, some of our lifetime. I hope it's going to change with some of the younger people. You know who's re partially responsible for that? Us, because we, we don't do anything about it. So what can we do about it? I don't know. That's part of the problem. But it starts with on the local level. It starts with being willing, for example, I don't agree with much of anything you do but I'm friends with you. Um, and and I, do, I, I got a feeling we agree on more than we disagree. But people need to at least talk to each other and have respect uh, for each other. It's, uh, I wish I knew, I don't have a solution for that. I don't have a solution for the cost of campaigns. Uh, you can't do something that's illegal, like tell a rich person they can't put $10 million or $20 million in their campaign, so if you put too many restrictions on the candidates that don't have personal money, uh, then you're penalizing them. So anyway, I, if I had, I'd be a consultant if I had answers to those problems. Anything else? Yes. I was just curious with your experience, the um, school of choice movement, what is your opinion? On oh, I'm very much for school of choice. Uh, the public schools of which nobody can doubt my loyalty to public schools. If they can, I'd like to share a few things with you. Now, I'm a strong believer in, in uh, choice. Um, when uh, the charter school movement started, now, by the way, charter schools until a week or two ago were under the State Board of Education, and they are charter public schools. Uh, they just don't have to go by the same rules. And so I said, when you, we find out what works in the charter schools, which rules they're not under, we need to take those rules out of the traditional public schools. We haven't done enough of that. Um, I'm also for the, I used to be, a, a, when it was called vouchers, I was opposed to it. But now that it's called economic uh, uh, opportunity scholarships uh, that will allow a poor person uh, to, to go to a private school with uh, some help from the taxpayers. But I think the legislature has made a tr terrible mistake by opening that up to uh, parents of wealth that don't, need, that don't need that help to send their children to private schools. So I'm for ch choice. I think the traditional public schools that I hope not in North Carolina, but in different places in the country have made so many dumb decisions in recent years that they're driving, some of them are driving people away uh, from the public schools and, and some of the, well, that would be getting into politics. But I, I think sometimes we're our own worst enemies. And uh, so I'm very much for the choice movement. I'm, uh, and, and I think it, I've seen many examples don't have time to quote them, but I've seen many examples of where competition has, uh, has helped public schools. In Edgecombe County, for example, I will give that one quickly. Edgecombe County, they had a very low performance school and uh, they started losing students to a charter school. The traditional school adopted a global school uh, plan 
uh, had brought teachers in from other countries and started teaching foreign languages and competed and they attracted those students from the charter school back into the traditional school. So there are many examples of where the charter school and the private school movement has made some positive difference. So uh, it's not a simple issue, I want to say that. Okay, thank you. It is for reading. So for those who do not know, Kiwanis places a book in every uh, in a classroom, and we're going to ask you to sign it because we will do it in honor. You just put an X. Yeah. So thank you. Let's give a big round of applause for Phil Kirk, thank you. the man that needs no introduction. We have 12 online. Thank you for joining us today. We're so happy to see you, and I want to welcome and invite our guests, David, Joel, Susan, Jackson, Kruparau, oh, pardon me if I didn't pronounce that right, Kruparau, um, please come back again. We'd love to have you. We are a great community. Rick, join us. Come back to the club. You once knew it, so... Um, we want you to do that. We do not meet next Friday. It is a holiday. We have $150 in our raffle. We have one more week. So on September the 8th, buy your ticket when you first come. We will draw at 1230, 50-50 raffle. Have, I hope everyone has a safe weekend. Be safe and see you on the 8th. <laughs>